one on my side, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Before we dive into today's webinar, there are a couple of housekeeping items I want to walk through with everyone. Uh, one, today's webinar is being recorded. Um, so currently, all attendees have been muted to prevent background noise from coming into the webinar. At the end of the webinar, you will, will receive a short evaluation survey. Uh, we do appreciate it if you could fill out that survey. It should only take a couple of minutes. All of the feedback that you all provide to us, we do use to improve for future events. And of course, we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have a question, feel free to put that into the chat or the Q&A feature that you see along the bottom of your screen throughout today's presentation, and we will address those at the end. Introducing our speakers today, we do have two guest speakers with us. First is Amy Durall, from, who is a fellow with the Office for Victims of Crime. Her fellowship centers around law enforcement response to victims and law enforcement-based victim services. Prior to joining OVC, Amy was a senior project manager with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where she worked on projects such as the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, Enhancing Law Enforcement Response to Victims, Law Enforcement-Based Victim Services, Documenting and Advancing Promising Practices in Law Enforcement Victim Support, and Research and Evaluation of Victims of Crime. Amy has also served as a Victim Services Director for two separate law enforcement agencies, both of which received national recognition for their Victim Services program during her tenure. She has also served on local and national committees focused on multidisciplinary and collaborative responses to victims. And to augment this direct practice experience, Amy has founded her own LLC to advance the prioritized focus on the rights, responses, and resources for individuals impacted by crime and crisis circumstances. She served as a consultant on projects aimed at criminal justice system interactions and enhanced victim response as a critical member for, of assessment teams for law enforcement agencies exploring their responses to violent crime and engagement of crime victims. Amy has enjoyed over 35 years of social service experience with a variety of populations, including youth and adults with developmental, emotional, and cognitive disorders, adults with mental health disorders, incarcerated adults, and protective services for children and adults, as well as those who may have experienced physical violence, including sexual violence, criminal victimization, and crisis circumstances. Our second presenter with us today is Caroline Huffaker, who is a senior program manager here at the National Policing Institute, where she manages several of our initiatives and grant projects. Additionally, she provides training and technical assistance, policy analysis, and strategic planning on complex law enforcement operations and public safety related topics. Caroline specializes in establishing multidisciplinary programming within the law enforcement setting and building coalitions across those disciplines to ensure that public safety services are being provided to the field are both research informed and practitioner led. Before joining us, she served as the Victim Services and Chaplains Director for the Chattanooga, Tennessee Police Department, where she established the agency's first professional victim services unit and contributed to developing and implementing several other projects at the department. This included supporting and developing the department's first peer support program, integrating a poverty simulation into their cadet academy curriculum, bi-weekly policy reviews, and revising the agency's promotional process. In addition to this work, Caroline has extensive experience in community-based advocacy, specifically in programming that serves victims and survivors of gender-based violence. She considers it a privilege to have served in the public safety field for over 13 years. Before I turn it over to our speakers today, we do hope to answer a few questions uh, for you all throughout today's presentation. Those questions being, what are victim services and what role do they play in departments? What are the current gaps in victim services? What are effective victim-centered and trauma-informed responses? And what resources are available to you all as you uh, begin integrating these into your department or as you enhance the integrations that you currently have? So with that, I will turn it over to our guest speakers today. Um, so Amy, I will let you take over. Um, and I am thrilled to be having this conversation. Um, 35 years in, I'm still learning about ways that we can all do our jobs better um, and ways that we can really focus on our specialized disciplines and make those collaboratively work together. Um, we're going to be talking today about two key concepts. Um, and I think Caroline and I will, will be kind of bouncing back and forth uh, around those. One of those is agencies, law enforcement agencies, obligations, duties, responsibilities, in how they respond to victims. 
And then we're going to be talking about those specialized personnel that, um, depending upon where you're at and what job titles people use, are the victim service personnel who have that specialized um, education skills, knowledge um, to be able to focus on um, services and effective responses to victims. And so for me, I am absolutely unequivocally biased when it comes to this topic. Um, I don't see how law enforcement agencies effectively respond to victims without having dedicated victim service personnel. Um, I've seen it be incredibly effective in multiple jurisdictions. And so I'm a strong proponent, um, but I also recognize that agencies as a whole have a responsibility to respond effectively to victims and it's not relegated to just victim service personnel. So we're gonna be talking about those concepts today. Um, we're gonna be pointing you to some high level resources that may help you in your agencies. Um, access some, you know, some support, some tools, some resources that will kind of guide your actions or your conversations um, in your collaborative and kind of holistic response to victims. So why does it matter, right? Why does it matter if law enforcement agencies have a response that's enhanced when it comes to victims? Um, what I can tell you is that when agencies effectively respond, the direct victims of those, of those incidents, of those crimes, absolutely reap benefits from that. Um, they experience a responsiveness to their unique needs when agencies pay attention, when agencies put policies and practices in place that, that you know, focus on the unique needs that victims have. Um, victims also experience um, an explanation of their rights, increased education about the justice system. Um, and when we talk about, you know, educating people about their rights, what I will say is that it goes beyond providing pamphlets to victims, right? What it really means is, are you making sure that you are conducting business in a way that they can readily assert and exercise those rights without any barriers, right? Is your agency approaching those statutory rights that victims have in a way that says, we're gonna meet this in a way that makes it easier for victims to engage with us, right? The other benefit that victims have is they get access to information, support, um, options, you know, uh, and resources that can help them while they're engaging with this entity called the justice system that can be incredibly overwhelming. Um, when agencies choose to enhance their response to victims, there's also benefits for the agencies themselves. And so what that means is that there tends to be enhanced victim engagement. Um, one of the things that I've talked about for years is there's language in the, in the justice system that tends to dissuade victims. Um, one of those is cooperation, right? And so when victims hear that, they hear a one-sided, out-of-balance relationship where I have to do what I'm told or I won't get what I want or I won't get what I need. Um, what we want to do is change the narrative to where we're actively engaging with victims. Um, as an adult human, I tend to pour my time, effort, energy into relationships that are reciprocal. I tend to pour that energy into people who return that energy to me, right? And when that happens, I stay engaged in those relationships, right? If I've got friends who call and check on me, I call and check on them, right? If I've got friends who take me out to dinner for my birthday, I tend to remember and do something kind for them, right? And so we have to view our relationship as agency representatives with victims in that same way. If we want them to stay engaged, we have to give them something to help them stay engaged. And what we typically find is that that varies from person to person, but it can be quite simple to identify what their needs are. Agencies also benefit by having this great pool of collaborative disciplines that work together for a common goal. I have learned so much from my law enforcement colleagues. I've learned things from my 
crime scene analysts that I've worked with. I've learned things from the front desk personnel. Um, I've learned things from property and evidence clerks, right? And so we all have to kind of recognize that our individual responsibilities need to be pulled together to benefit our agency as a whole when we all focus on how we respond to victims. Um, and what that translates into, quite frankly, benefits for the communities, there's increased trust and legitimacy when, when communities experience law enforcement. Um, crime victims are a significant portion of the community population. And that statistically <laughs> enhances your interaction with them as agency representatives. They are a significant portion of the community that sways um, value and opinions and how, how your relationship with the community is communicated to other people. And so it's really important if you as an agency take stock in how are we responding to the people who are harmed? Are we doing that effectively? Um, you'll see that once you raise that, once you elevate that, you're gonna see benefits to, to all three of these categories. We're gonna flip into a quick video that summarizes why it's not just one person's responsibility. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Chattanooga Police Department for what feels like a very long period of time and, and a short period of time all, at the, all, all simultaneously. Um, but I really got to see them commit to this concept of enhancing the entire agency's response to victims. And this is just a real quick snippet about what their leadership thought of that at the time. We had to make sure that our mission, vision, and values not only reflected us, but reflected the expectations of the people we serve. This is designed to help you understand more about different units in the department, how we do things, how we communicate, terminology we use, tactics we use, what our policies and procedures look like. We wanted to make sure that we included components that were community-centered, community-driven. Items like equality and responsiveness, respect, were mixed in with the words that do drive and inspire police officers, courage, integrity, honor. What I can say is, although that was a really short clip, what it represents is Chief Roddy, who is now retired, but his position on making sure that every employee at his agency understood that enhanced victim response was a priority. Um, and so it didn't just get relegated, to the people who were assigned as victim service personnel, but he really made sure that, that it was clearly communicated that it was everybody's responsibility. We're gonna talk a little bit about models of service provision and, and the common setups that we see with law enforcement agencies around the nation. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see law enforcement-based victim services. And I think it's really important that we understand the varying relationships that victim service personnel have with law enforcement agencies so that we understand what we're engaging with and what expectations we're setting. So law enforcement based victim service personnel are personnel that are hired. What is advocacy? Sorry, I'm gonna flip back. There we go. Law enforcement-based victim service personnel are personnel that are actually hired by the agency themselves. These are direct employees of the agency and they're there to serve victims that are, that are within the jurisdictional response of the agency. They can be, most often they are paid employees, but it can also include interns and volunteers um, that are directly connected with the agency. What I can tell you is when they're employed by the agency, they're subject to the same background process as every other employee of the agency. They're subject to um, CJIS training to make sure that they get access to those records. Um, they typically get access to the RMS system so that they can see you know, police reports and supplements and things that are being documented on cases to make sure that they have access to the active information as it's transpiring. The key part about this is that they also are representatives of the agency itself. So when they're interacting with victims, 
they represent the agency that's hired them, right? When we go to that middle section where it says hybrid community-based victim services, these are personnel that are typically employed by a community-based organization. And that organization is in a formal relationship with the law enforcement agency. So that could be through a contract, through an MOU, through a cooperative agreement of some kind, where the community-based organization and the law enforcement agency jointly decide how these victim service personnel are gonna respond. Um, they may or may not go through that background process and get access to the RMS system and CGIS records. Um, but it's important to note that they do not represent the law enforcement agency in that relationship. So when they're interacting with victims, they represent the organization that hired them, which is a community-based organization. And then that third bullet is for direct community-based victim services. And these are employees of community-based organizations. Um, they do not go through any background or access to any law enforcement records, anything like that, and they don't represent law enforcement agencies. That doesn't mean that they can't work in partnership and be good stewards and be collaborative, um, you know, working professionals with law enforcement. It just means that there's no formal relationship where they represent the law enforcement agency in any way or get access to those records. Super important that everybody understands those distinctions because it all affects information sharing, documentation of our interactions as victim service personnel, um, and certainly Brady disclosure obligations, depending upon what type of employee you are. Regardless of what model your agency choose to engage in, um, there are some similarities that you can expect for victim service personnel. And this video is gonna quickly take you through that to kind of set the tone for what we mean when we're talking about victim service personnel and what kind of services they provide. What is advocacy? Advocacy means empowering people to have a voice speaking for them when they can't and supporting them to speak for themselves when they can. An advocate can support someone in many different ways. An advocate can help a person to speak up for themselves or give their views. An advocate can help a person to understand the process they are going through, their rights and what choices are available to them. An advocate can help a person to be part of an important decision being made about them. An advocate can help a person to prepare for and take part in meetings and tribunals. An advocate can help a person to raise queries and concerns. An advocate can help a person to access information in the format that is most suitable. An advocate can help a person to access services that support them. Advocates can also provide information. Sorry about that, guys. Um what I think is important about that short video is to understand that it's really the job of victim service personnel to make sure and lay out options, choices, availability, information to help people that who have, who have experienced victimization get the best service and the best pathway for engagement possible, right? And so it's not really the job of victim service personnel to talk victims into pressing charges or to talk victims into, you know, pursuing a certain line of accountability that feels right to the professionals who are investigating the case. Um, the job of the victim service personnel and the job of the advocates that are involved is really to help position those victims so that they can engage fully in the system that they happen to be partaking in at the current moment. Um, what I can tell you is even though there are some communities who have done a really great job of engaging with victim service personnel, some communities have done a really great job of hiring them, 
there still are gaps in, in victim services, right? And so what do we mean when, when we say there's gaps? One of the biggest areas where I saw gaps taking place is this concept of where do victims' rights start, right? I happen to be part of um, some assessment teams. We got to do quite a bit of work with multiple law enforcement agencies around the nation, um, did some case study processes on multiple law enforcement agencies. And what I heard quite frequently when I asked about victims' rights is I heard something similar to, well, we don't need to worry about that. That happens when, when it gets to prosecution. And what I can tell you is victims' rights start the minute that a crime is reported to your agency. That's when they attach. That's when they're available. And if we as agency representatives aren't doing a good job of explaining victims' rights to people, helping them actually assert and exercise those rights, we're setting them up for missed opportunities, right? We're setting them up for missed opportunities to get access to information that they need or to exercise financial compensation processes as a direct result of being involved in a crime. And so it's really, really important that we as agency representatives in law enforcement take a look at, are we doing a good job of making sure that we're providing victims with their statutory rights? Are we making sure that we're adjusting our processes to make those accessible to them? The other gap that exists is that quite often charges aren't filed, right? We, we know in law enforcement that many things are reported. Um, it requires a threshold of establishing probable cause before presenting to prosecution and then prosecution chooses to go forward with charges. Um, what I can say is in my 35 years of experience, the percentage of cases going forward to prosecution was, was markedly lower than the, than the number of cases being reported. And so if we wait for victims' rights and we wait for some of those conversations, for prosecution, we're gonna miss opportunities. We're gonna miss gaps in services, right? What we also know is that many times, even when charges are filed, there's gaps in services. After people get sentenced, the, the people available to help victims diminishes significantly. We also know there's gaps in community services. Oftentimes that's around victimization categories. So if you look in your communities, you may have community organizations that provide domestic violence, sexual assault responses, but there's not really much available for people of, who are victims of gun violence or aggravated assaults or fraud. Um, and so there are gaps in that way as well. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna switch it over to Caroline and she's gonna talk through specifically what agency responses may look like. Thank you so much, Amy. Well, I am working towards getting um, control to progress. There we go, slides. Thank you, Sam. Forward, um, we are going to be shifting into what um, agency response can look like. Um, and so when we were preparing today's presentation and the materials, we wanted to talk about um, particularly, obviously agency-based, so meaning um, victim services professionals working within the law enforcement setting, um, and then also agency operations um, towards victims and survivors of all crime types. Um, and we kind of had three hallmark um, components of an effective, effective victim response. Um, and they are what you see before you. First, when we talk about opportunity and responsibility, I think that um, and, and I can attest to this on my own personal experience of working within a law enforcement agency of making that shift in a way to, um, instead of certainly we have an obligation and a, and a duty to respond to victims and survivors, but shifting our mindset into what an opportunity that is and an ethical responsibility that we have to serve victims and survivors in a way that is compassionate um, that's trauma-informed, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say trauma-informed here in a second, um, a way that integrates their ability to not only be notified of their rights, but for us to encourage them to actively exercise and engage their rights. Um, that is certainly a shift 
um, in, in public safety operations, not just that we're going to hand someone a card and say these are your rights as a victim of a crime, but what questions do you have about them? Um, and then at various, you know, in, integral parts of the criminal justice and judicial response is hearkening back to those rights and helping that victim survivor if they haven't already make that connection back to, and this is a key part of your rights as a victim and survivor of crime in this state or this jurisdiction, um, territory. And so uh, again, seeing it as that opportunity to continue integrating that kind of response and that level of response. Um, and then again, connecting them to the resources um, that will fully support and serve them, whether it's within, again, the agency setting of perhaps victim services personnel. Um, but then as you see, we're gonna talk about external partnerships and what those can look like. Um, internal partnerships are another element of effective victim response. And Amy kind of alluded to that and, and highlighted how um, all agency personnel have a role in serving and supporting victims and survivors of crime. So certainly uh, for me as being previous law enforcement based victim services personnel, that was, you know, when I would talk with our officers, I would say that is my assignment. I'm assigned to the victim services unit, but we all have that opportunity and responsibility to serve victims and survivors. So how does that victim experience, you know, our particular police department from their very first interaction there at the front desk? How um, are they treated? Are they given um, the correct information, access to services? Are they directed appropriately to um, the appropriate personnel all the way up to whoever sits in the chief's office? Um, we're going to talk about how that supports the critical need of victims. Um, but internal partnerships can span all job assignments, all rank and file, um, professional staff, non-sworn, civilian, whatever terminology you use, um, to your sworn staff, um, to those folks that might be a little bit of both, right? You, we, at my previous agency, we had uh, retired uh, professionals come back in and help us with case management aspects. And so those inter internal partnerships were just as integral as our external partnerships. Those external partnerships can be everything from your faith community to um, advocacy to healthcare organizations and allied professionals. Uh, we worked extensively with our school system and our um, institutions of higher education because we, in my particular jurisdiction, had uh, four um, institutes of higher ed. That was a lot of student, student population and um, we relied heavily on the resources that those um, external partners provided to students and, and who identified as victims and survivors of crime. And so those external partnerships can streamline um, an effective response to victims and help fill some of those gaps that perhaps, you know, as Amy was talking about on the previous slide, that we, particularly in the agency, may not be able to assist with because perhaps prosecution is over and the case has reached a certain um, status in the judicial system and it's been finally adjudicated. So we were able to utilize that external partnership network to create a system of care for victims that could exist long after uh, their engagement with our agency. There's a couple of different personnel models um, really quickly that I'm going to talk a little bit about, but the main features that you'll see are we have these two kind of terminologies or terms that we use. We use the term centralized and decentralized. And it sounds very much like it, like it is. Uh, centralized would be um, all of your victim services staff or personnel reporting to a singular um, supervisor. And then the one that you're seeing in front of you um, that is a model very similar to what I operated in when I was in the law enforcement setting, uh, responded to higher levels of uh, within a chain of command. So I responded directly to an assistant chief. In this example, it's your chief of staff who then speaks, uh, you know, reports directly to your agency executive, chief, sheriff, commissioner, what have you. Um, there is um, a lot of times with centralized models, they're not what we call embedded. So that means when we say embedded, we mean they're not embedded within a specialized unit. Um, so they might just be more generalized. So in the example of our agency, um, we had 
um, some staff that um, reported to all or responded to all crime victim types that were uh, receiving investigative services through our agency. And then we also did have some that were working with patrol teams, but yet at the end of the day, they still responded um, to one particular supervisor and one chain of command. In the centralized or decentralized uh, model that you see in front of you, decentralized and embedded, uh, decentralized means there's not that one singular point of contact. Perhaps your victim services personnel, because they're embedded within specialized units um, or perhaps one specialized function such as patrol, they're going to be responding to the supervisor of that particular unit. So that might be your sergeant, your lieutenant, um, and that particular chain of command. Um, so in the case before you, you see you have folks that are uh, talking or spending time with homicide cases, and then you have folks with robbery. Um, there are, again, a lot of benefits and value to both. Uh, we're not saying one is better for the other. We wanted to provide these solely for the fact that um, they can uh, disperse resources in different ways, depending on what capacity your agency has. Uh, for example, in the centralized, I experienced a level of emphasis and value because I responded or reported directly to a chief um, and then, or an assistant chief and a chief of staff and a chief versus um, in the decentralized model, you have the opportunity or the, the pro of really forming strong cohesive unit bonds because you're consistently working with the investigators, you can establish buy-in in ways that maybe um, a centralized team may not be able to. So that's a whole other training we could talk with folks on, particularly Amy, um, as she has worked in, in multiple different settings and engaged with agencies that have both models. Um, so again, it's more about what resources do you have available to you? What are your staffing levels like? What do you envision based on the culture and the organizational environment of your agency would, would um, not only support staff, but serve victims most effectively? So when we talk about victim-centered and trauma-informed, I would imagine a lot of you have probably heard these terms. Um, they're pretty uh, common uh, terminology that we use today both in the advocacy and professional victim services settings, but also uh, in law enforcement settings. We're seeing these um, terms come up a lot more, but um, for the sake of just making sure we're all on the same page, when we use the term victim-centered, um, it really is just like it sounds. It's keeping the victim at the center of all policies, procedures, approaches, and responses, um, and keeping them as the central focus. This also means not just keeping them, but it's keeping their stated needs, desires, um, values, um, what they see as being important to them to um, engage in this process at the forefront of all of our responses. Um, it's important to note that because there can be a number of people, as you see in front of you, serving a victim and survivor in one case, uh, it can include state and child welfare or adult welfare. It can include prosecutors, community health, victim services. All of these different entities are there to serve the victim. And we all, um, because of the nature of our jobs, might have different capacities and limitations to what we do. And so what being victim-centered allows us to do as professionals is to kind of coalesce around a one single focal point, and that is the victim and survivor that we are serving. And so it can help us transcend the disciplinary differences that we might be uh, just by nature of our jobs be experiencing, not because we're being uh, a bad partner uh, or a collaborator, it's just the nature of our jobs. So it really does help us coalesce around a central focal point, which is going to be that victim and survivor. And then when we're talking about trauma informed, I think most of us would probably all know at this point, we um, in the medical field, in the law enforcement field, in the advocacy field are realizing that trauma and its impact on the brain is much deeper and wider than perhaps what we originally thought. And so having a trauma-informed approach um, allows us to have that framework of understanding trauma and its impact on an individual's um, uh, 
honestly, just on every facet of their life. <laughs> it can impact communication and speech patterns. It can impact memory. It can impact um, their ability and um, accessibility to engage with a system, whether that be a physical system like transportation or a, a larger theoretical system like law enforcement, right? Um, and so what we have to do in a trauma-informed approach is educate ourselves and understanding or being curious about how that victim and survivor's um, traumatic experience of being a victim of a crime might be impacting um, their engagement with us, but also um, educating our partners and then also using that uh, approach to inform policy development, responses, training curriculum, um, and understanding um, all the ways in which um, this might be impacting um, the, the people that we serve, our constituents. And so it also, what I've seen too, is educating sometimes victims and survivors themselves. Um, I think there's a lot of normalizing that we can do um, for those that we serve when we say, you know, um, some of the most powerful experiences have been when I've seen an investigator say, uh, in response to a victim who said, I, I just can't remember, I can't remember. And then saying, I understand that, that um, your brain and your body may not be in a place where it's ready to process that yet, or you're still processing and normalize that experience for that victim and survivor. So we also have an obligation or an opportunity um, to educate and inform victims um, on some of the things that they may be experiencing and norming that for them as well. So in this um, approach that we uh, had the opportunity of implementing at Chattanooga, um, it's a philosophical framework um, called ELERV or Enhancing Law Enforcement's Response to Victims. One of the most beneficial frameworks that came out of that was what we call the seven critical needs of victims. And this actually isn't just something that um, you know, folks uh, put together without uh, the guidance and, and informing uh, from victims and survivors themselves. This is um, actually born out of um, a long um, road and journey to uh, multiple convenings, multiple focus groups, information, um, interviews, um, and what came out of all of those efforts um, with OVC and their stakeholders in that, e in that um, endeavor was these seven critical needs. So when you're thinking about not just um, incorporating victim services personnel into your agency, but this is that larger philosophical framework that you could integrate um, that could help you achieve that while you're in the process of, you know, building a victim services unit, maybe getting into an MOU relationship to have a hybrid setup, um, or if you're just not at a place in your agency yet, where you can have full-time staff or that hybrid setup is you're still relying on your key community partners is, again, these are some of the needs and the ways in which you can support that effective law enforcement response to victims and survivors of crime. And so the first is safety. What we're looking for um, is understanding and knowing that a victim's and survivors' sense of the world um, and their understanding of safety uh, currently and future um, is impacted by what they experienced. And so a lot of times your victim services personnel, but also law enforcement can do a lot of um, safety planning to uh, look for ways that they can involve themselves in risk reduction planning. We know that um, victims are often unfortunately um, at a higher risk of being re-victimized post an initial victimization. And so we want to work with them collaboratively on what safety looks like for them in the immediate aftermath, but also at key elements of the criminal justice and judicial system to promote physical, emotional, and psychological safety. We want to provide support to them, which is that next critical need, is helping them navigate justice systems um, and the judicial processes uh, I have been working in this field for a number of years now, and I learn something new every single day uh, about, um, you know, constitutional, uh, <laughs> constitutional, uh, you know, practices and, and what is being currently ruled on at a federal level, all the way down to city code and um, everything that comes with working within layers of criminal justice and judicial systems, and it's incredibly confusing. 
and I work in this field every single day. Um, and so helping folks navigate um, and providing them with opportunities for support with connecting them to victim services personnel who uh, could, you know, uh, serve and support them um, throughout the duration of that process. And then, of course, um, availability of support persons as designated by that individual victim or survivor themselves who I see as being a meaningful support system for them may not be a meaningful support system to that person in real life. So it's my obligation or my duty uh, to ask them um, who is supportive. We wanna provide that information again about the criminal justice and judicial system processes, their rights and resources, um, who um, they can contact and not just who they can contact, um, but if that change in point of contact changes, as we know can often happen in the law enforcement setting, um, making sure we have um, a consistent um, handoff or a supportive handoff to someone. Um, and then status of the investigation and prosecution. A lot of times if you haven't already looked at your um, statutory obligations for victims and survivors of crime in your state and your jurisdiction, that is um, an important element of crime victims' rights is to receive information about the status of their case and prosecution of it. We wanna provide access, and that isn't just to physical spaces. Of course, we want to provide access um, by way of making sure our building um, is physically accessible, but also that can be information, uh, making sure that our Victims' rights information, supportive service information, um, both in written and spoken or oral form, um, is um, available in a variety of languages. Um, and then paying attention to any additional needs or barriers. One of the most helpful uh, uh, quotes that I heard about access one time was, um, there's a stark difference between all are welcome here versus this was designed specifically with you in mind. And I think that's incredibly important with victims. It's not just to say enough to say we support victims here. We want to design our very physical structures and then programmatic structures specifically with victims and their rights in mind. Continuity is another one of our critical needs. We want to have that collaborative relationship both internally and externally with other professionals that are serving that victim. And with that, that means we need to have a clear understanding of each other's roles. I would always tell our officers, it's important for you to understand my role because I don't want um, us to overpromise on something and then inadvertently under deliver, right? Um, so that's why it's really important for me to understand where my role ends and someone else's begins. Data sharing to the extent that it's appropriate or um, that we're able to share, right? There are some specific things that we have to be mindful of when we're constructing agency-based and hybrid and community-based models. Um, but to the extent that we're available, we should be engaging in those practices. Voice is another one um, that's incredibly important. It is very easy, I think, for us that work within these systems. Um, we hear ourselves talk a lot and share a lot of information, um, but it's important to hit the pause button consistently and often to encourage victims and survivors to ask questions. And that includes the people um, that are in that supportive circle for that victim and survivor. So perhaps if I'm working um, with a victim and their designated support person is making sure that individual can have their questions and concerns heard as well. Um, we wanna invite them into the process that is um, intended to be serving them, actively um, asking them to participate in case-related and agency discussions. Um, we see this at the prosecutorial level as well. So asking them what they would like to see happen with a case. Um, and some of your victims' uh, rights laws might have that written into your statutory obligations that um, the victim and survivor has the right to be heard um, in those types of measures. And then understanding that justice is just as much of a critical need, but that justice looks different for everybody. Uh, it's very easy for us to have um, outcome-focused versions or definitions of justice. We want that guilty verdict. We want that you know, case clearance to reach a certain threshold. But what we find with victims um, and survivors is that a lot of times they want what we call non-verdict victories, right? They want to have um, the opportunity to be heard. Perhaps they wanna seek restitution in one particular way um, through the civil court system. Perhaps they really want to just have their victim impact statement read, whether they are able to read it themselves or not, right? So I think that's where, again, 
Um, we look for their input. We actively invite that into the process to understand um, that there's a lot of ways that victims and survivors will come out the other side of the criminal justice and judicial process and feel as though it worked for them. And it may have nothing to do with whether or not a guilty verdict was rendered or whether or not we were able to effect an arrest. Um, so it's important for us to keep uh, that in mind. So really quickly, some uh, brief ways uh, that we can talk about uh, victim-centered tra and trauma-informed practices is personnel training. Again, looking at training every personnel, whether you're sworn or professional staff at every rank and file. So that can look at um, training through in-service, your cadet academy. Uh, we used to have, um, you know, professional staff onboarding. So when we had records clerks or front desk staff, we would train them um, and vice versa. They would train our personnel as well in victim services. You want to look at policy revision and creation of those policies. Um, so that can look like incorporating victim services or advocacy personnel in policy review committees or asking them um, if you don't have staff uh, full time in your agency, sending it to a partner and saying, hey, would you mind looking at this? I would really like uh, for you to provide us feedback and moving not just beyond how the victim experiences your agency, um, but are you taking intentional steps to incorporate victims' rights law and statutory uh, obligations that we have by the law uh, into our policies and procedures? We want to look at our review of documentation. Are we writing our reports in a way that is victim-centered and trauma-informed? Um, how, uh, who has access to those uh, records? Um, who um, is able to request those records? Our PIOs and communications personnel um, up to date on the latest um, FOIA uh, legislation and obligations? Um, or how do we write our press releases and release information out into the public? Um, and then, of course, incorporating victim services personnel into every aspect of your operational um, structure. So everything from your org chart to um, at my agency, I was blessed enough to be incorporated into executive staff um, and command staff meetings. And I was expected to report out and participate in key decision-making elements in and around investigative practices um, because those inadvertently are serving victims and survivors of crime. So what are all the ways in which that you can incorporate victim services professionals into the very operations of your agency? And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Amy again to let her talk about some resources that we've referenced and some other great uh, tools that she's pulled for everybody today. Thank you, Thank you for um, what I'm hoping that everybody walks away with is just a level of curiosity. Um, if this is a topic that um, is of interest to you, um, you are certainly not gonna get everything that you need from this webinar. <laughs> Um, but there are some helpful resources that can that can help you start conversations, have really good, thoughtful discussions within your own agency about, you know, what does this look like if we're going to respond to victims effectively? What, where do we want to start? What do we want to do? Um, and one of the things that I can tell you is that the ELERF project that we've referenced, um, there are countless resources available to you. To, within that project to help you guide some of those larger conversations around how is the agency responding to victims. I like to describe this project, this strategy as top to bottom, side to side in all four corners of your organization, right? So not just particular people, don't put the, the burden on how our patrol officers doing, it is everybody in every process within the organization. Um, for context, to do it effectively, it's an ongoing commitment. Um, I was assigned to be the subject matter expert for a couple of agencies who did the last iteration of supported um, implementation of this strategy, and we were engaged with those agencies for four and a half years doing regular site visits. And so it's not something that you can do in a six-month time window. It's something that really you have to strategically plan um, and make sure that you're thinking it through. Um, but there are so many resources within that 
that particular project that you can get. Um, if you find that it's overwhelming, you can certainly reach out to me and we're gonna talk about that opportunity in just a minute. Um, another great high level resource is the Law Enforcement Based Victim Services Project. It is strictly dedicated to supporting agencies who choose to hire victim service personnel. So how do you make sure that those personnel are integrated into your agency in the most effective way possible? Do you have the right policies in place, hiring practices? Do you have a code of ethic that, that makes sense for those personnel? Um, there are tons of resources that are available within that project, webinars, publications, and template packages that can give you a really good head start um, if this is an area that you're interested in. There's another project that um, focused on case studies of existing agencies and how they responded to um, integrating victim-centered trauma-informed practices. Um, I don't think the case studies have been posted yet, so I would keep checking back on this website, but there's an agency self-assessment tool that might be a really good resource for starting conversations within your organization. Um, Caroline and I are super excited because next year we are going to be doing an entire series of webinars with the Justice Clearinghouse on law enforcement based victim services. So teasing you a lot of information today, but we're going to be diving into that. There's going to be a series of eight webinars that are going to be happening in 2024 from January through December that talks about the integration of law enforcement based victim services. So Keep an eye out. You're going to be getting a flyer. Pay attention to that. Save the date if you're interested, right? Um, what I'm personally excited about is this is um, a unique opportunity. My fellowship has made um, access to support law enforcement um, around response to victims incredibly easy, incredibly um, enticing. If you are interested in getting tailored training and technical assistance, no cost, um, if it's something that you feel would be helpful to have a discussion, to maybe have somebody review your policies, to I, I at this point have um, been asked to help an agency who's planning to hire 10 victim service personnel to train their existing personnel so that they can then train the new people coming on. Um, there are unique ways in which you can engage me as a fellow to provide free help to your agencies. And so you're gonna get a flyer on that as well. And I certainly don't wanna be remiss, um, but you also have free assistance from NPI and this particular project that has hosted us for this webinar. So there are plenty of ways for you to get assistance around this topic area that will cost you nothing but time commitment and, and personnel, you know, subject matter expertise and interest. So, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Sam, who can close this out. Great. Thank you both so much, Amy and Caroline. And as um, Amy mentioned as well, those of you who are part of our program as RVCR grantees do also have access uh, through us for some of those assistance as well. For anybody that heard anything today that interested them or wants additional assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will put a contact information slide up on the screen in just a few minutes. Um, but at this point, we do want to open it up to questions from the audience for our last uh, five minutes or so that we have together. So if you haven't already, please feel free to go ahead and put your questions in either the chat or the Q&A feature here at the bottom of the screen. While folks are doing it, I am going to bring up that contact information slide for just a minute so that folks can take screen grabs or copy down information. Um, we will be sharing this presentation in the flyers um, that Amy mentioned shortly after this, as well as the recording will be posted on our website for future access. Um, so with that, I am going to start facilitating some of the questions that we're getting in. Um, so Amy and Caroline, both feel free to tackle these questions as you see fit. Um, but we do have a current grantee in the program who is doing a cost sharing model for their victim services um, support. And for them, it has been successful, but for other agencies out there who may, may be more limited in resources, how have you all seen those cost sharing models for victim services play out? Have you seen success there? Yeah, I'll start with this, Caroline, if you don't mind. Um, I um, 
in one of the jurisdictions, um, I worked for an agency that provided victim services on behalf of and for 10 other agencies. Um, we just reached a capacity threshold where we couldn't do that any longer. Our, our surrounding jurisdictions and smaller cities were growing, population was soaring. Um, we couldn't keep up with the demand. And so I worked with one of those agencies um, to, to become a lead agency and they developed a collaborative relationship with two other agencies and ended up providing a cost sharing victim services unit. We had one of them was a lead, two were supporting that. They based their cost, cost sharing off of calls for service. Um, they ended up hiring two personnel that served all three agencies and they split their time you know, to dedicated days of the week where they would be present in those organizations to make sure that they built rapport with the staff of each one of those agencies. And then they split the costs associated with personnel benefits, equipment, uniforms, et cetera, based on those calls for service percentages. Um, it worked out incredibly well for them. Um, but I've also seen that play out when I worked at IACP, we supported many, many, many jurisdictions and for rural communities, it can be a really effective model. Um, what I will say is it takes quite a bit of commitment to make sure that you're communicating effectively, make sure that you're working with organizations who are willing to share information um, and come to the table to have regular conversations about implementing victim services through a cost sharing model um, because it does take upkeep, right? Um, one of the factors that contributed to that success was they all used the same RMS system. And so documentation ended up being consistent across um, you know, all three of those agencies. And so there are things to consider, but it can certainly be incredibly effective um, to get victim services directly implemented in, in smaller communities. Caroline, anything to add on that? No, I would just say, you know, oftentimes too, that it, it seems like an administrative um, feat to do a model like that. But again, as Amy said, you know, you can absolutely endeavor to do that. It's just making sure that um, everybody is on the same page, that there's a clear delineation of who's responsible for what. Um, but we see this type of model used a lot of times in my jurisdiction. Um, I saw this used for um, our communications process. We actually did a shared cost model with our communications with our county, um, who then contracted with each municipality. And so um, it is feasible. So, you know, say if you have a communications model with your emergency communications for your local jurisdiction, maybe ask how they manage that and use that framework for victim services, because that can be incredibly helpful. So those models exist out there in other elements of public safety operations victim services can just follow in that same vein because a lot of those frameworks are actually out in existence. Um, it's just perhaps you've never used them for uh, victim services personnel before. So definitely uh, worth looking into, particularly if you're covering uh, large areas, if you're reaching capacity issues, it can absolutely get programs up and running. And then perhaps in the future be used as a proof of concept for why you need your own particularized funding stream from your city council, county commission, whatever that, you know, you can use that to, to uh, further uh, your program in the future. Thank you. I am gonna to try to squeeze one more question here with you all, if you don't mind. Um, we do have another question here. An agency is reporting seeing kind of an, an increase in their areas in terms of uh, intimate partner violence type cases. Um, and just wanted to know with your experience working with agencies across the country, are, are you seeing that as well in terms of victim services provision or um, you know, what kind of trends have you all seen? Um, I'll start and say, um, I think there's a lot of factors to consider, but yes, certainly there's been an uptick in, in some communities, right? Um, I think the pandemic, what we now know, has had a marked impact on, on certain crime types. Um, and that has been um, kind of flushed out with data and, and response policies that, that agencies enacted in during that time. Um, and so certainly that happens. Um, I think that I've been in this area for long enough to know that things tend to swing on pendulums, right? And so um, 
funding decisions influence how much we hear about certain things. It also influences how much certain programs are supported or not supported. Um, I can say that, that if there is an increase, then it's time for victim service personnel to double down and start working together. Um, it's really a time to figure out where your gaps are in the response in your communities. When law enforcement is taking those, do you have the right people in place at the right intersections to be able to effectively respond to people? Um, if people are not accessing the community-based organizations, maybe it's time to look at a model of placing victim service personnel within the law enforcement agencies so that they can get immediate access. I would also encourage people to take a look at implementing risk assessment processes, right? To make sure that there's some consistent way of consistently referring people to the appropriate resources when those, when those crime types are identified. Caroline, anything to add on that question? Yeah, I would just add that um, certainly that can inform um, as you're building out your programs, any of your staffing decisions. So if you're endeavoring to serve one particular crime type, such as that decentralized but embedded model, where you're gonna have folks that are serving solely victims and survivors of gender-based violence, or are you gonna have that centralized but more generalized um, crime victim uh, response with professional victim services. And so um, if you have access within your agency to kind of analyze some of your own data, if you're noticing some of those trends that can absolutely inform your staffing models when it comes to victim services, just like it informs your staffing models when you go to staff your patrol teams, your investigative units, uh, so on and so forth. And so, uh, and then of course, just to kind of echo what Amy said, you know, the pandemic certainly shook a lot of things loose in terms of what we thought we were going to anticipate with crime victim reporting or what we anticipated um, with uh, communities experiencing. And so I think a lot of that still remains to be seen. And it's a lot of conversations around what came first, the chicken or the egg, um, <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, the contributing factors to, um, you know, crime offenses and then crime victimizations um, post 2020. So it's still something I think that we'll be studying for years, um, but in a practical sense and for the purposes of staffing, it can absolutely inform operations here and now. And if I can add on to that, one thing mm -hmm. that I think Caroline brought up a really great point of pulling data, um, because what I have found is people tend to um, have very passionate or you know emblazoned responses around certain crime types. And when you pull data, it may not be what you think it is, right? And so we've done that with multiple agencies where we've encouraged them, pull your data and then do a quick community needs pulse, right? Where are the existing services? And you might be surprised that you already have five agencies that respond to that particular crime type where victims of other categories have nothing. And so that may also impact how you choose to lay out your staffing models, your service provision models, your supervision structure, where you place victim service personnel in your organization. And I think it's also important, no matter what you decide, when you're, when you're incorporating victim service personnel into law enforcement agencies, you have to think about growth. And so, you may need one person today, but I guarantee you once they start working and responding to victims, that will quickly increase to where you're like, I don't know how we survived without this person and we now need four more, right? And so how you make decisions about where you place them, who supervises them, where they're located within the department um, can, can impact future growth potential as well, so. Great. Well, thank you both. I know we are right at time here, a little over. So thank you all for staying with us. Just as we close out today, a reminder that we you will be directed to an evaluation survey when you close out of today's event. Um, if you are able to complete that survey, we do appreciate it. It should take less than five minutes and we use it to inform future events. 
um, as well as topics for those events. So um, uh, if you'd like to hear more, learn more about victim services and rural agencies, uh, do feel free to put that in there. And again, I want to thank our speakers, Amy and Caroline, for joining us today and providing this great presentation. If folks have any questions, the contact information is on the screen. Feel free to reach out. And as mentioned earlier, we will share these resources um, after the event today. With that, we'll go ahead and close out and thank you everyone for spending some time with us this afternoon.